What's going on guys? In today's video I'm going to be showing you how to build a PS2 Bluetooth adapter which will let you use a variety of Bluetooth enabled controllers on the PlayStation 1 and PlayStation 2. This adapter is based off the super popular ESP32 microcontroller. The code for this project was created by Darth Cloud and the PCB along with the 3D printed casing was designed by MI213 over on Twitter. Before we dive in, a little info on this project. This PS2 adapter is based on Darth Cloud's Blue Retro project, which is a universal Bluetooth adapter compatible with many consoles and controllers, and is being constantly updated with new features. Today we're just going to be looking at making M1213's plug and play PS2 version. In the future we may look at making other console versions as well. This adapter pairs up beautifully with the DualShock 4 wireless controller and it's highly recommended to use this controller with the PS2. Okay, with all of that out of the way, let's dive into the video. To make this adapter, you're going to need a few things. These are a bare ESP32 4 megabyte module, two 3mm diffused LEDs, either a new PS2 controller plug or one salvaged from an old controller. Please note that there are a few different revisions of the official PS2 controller plug. You'll need to check which version you have before printing the housing. I'll put up the differences on the screen now. The housings provided for this project are only compatible with either the specified blank controller plug or one of the genuine plugs shown before. For this video, I'll be showing both the new third-party plug type and the Type 3 controller versions. Controller Type 2 and 3 use the same 3D printed housing, whereas Type 1 is different and it requires its own housing design. The new blank connector is listed as AliExpress type in the 3D print file section on the GitHub page. Next you'll need the PCB files and your specific housing design to go with your chosen connector. For the AliExpress style connector I chose a clear resin print all around. And for the official PS2 plug housing I chose a frosted top and a clear red bottom housing to match the red PCBs. Next you'll need all the small components to build out the circuit. These are a SOT223 3.3 volt linear buck regulator. Unfortunately I could only get my hands on the SOT89 version for this video. The pinout is exactly the same, it's just smaller. Next you'll need two 16 volt 10 microfarad 0805 size ceramic capacitors. I purchased all my capacitors and resistors in a multi-pack of differing sizes to make things easier. Two 1 nanofarad 0603 size ceramic capacitors. One 100 nanofarad 0805 sized ceramic capacitor. Two 10 kilo ohm 0603 sized resistors. Two 4.7 kilo ohm 0603 sized resistors. These are for the LEDs. You can tweak this value from 1 to 5 kilo ohms to adjust the LED brightness. The lower the value, the brighter they'll be. 4.7 kilo ohms seems to be the sweet spot. Next, you'll need a 3 by 4 millimeter 2 pin surface mount tactile switch and a 4.5 by 4.5 by 8 mm right angle 3 pin through hole push button switch. After that you'll need a USB UART TTL adapter that can be set to 5 volts. This is actually the same one used in my PS3 Syscon tutorial from a few videos back. And to go with that UART adapter you'll need 4 female ended breadboard jumper wires. Next you'll need some wire, I'm just using some ribbon cable I got from Amazon. Following the wire you'll need 4 M2 by 10 mm screws along with 4 matching M2 nuts. After that you'll need some way to cut the PCB. I'm just using a small saw and a file to sand down the rough edges after cutting. And lastly you'll need some solder, a fine tip soldering iron, flush cut snips, tweezers and optionally some no clean flux which will make the process much easier. Okay, once you have all your required items it's time to prep the circuit board. The design of this adapter uses a portion of the circuit board as the front panel for the adapter. This front panel is part of the main PCB design and needs to be cut off the board. To do this is very straightforward, just use your cutting implement of choice and cut through the thin sections of the PCB. I chose to cut mine most of the way and then snap it off as I don't have a vise to hold the PCB. After that I used my file and filed down the nubs so the front panel will fit in the housing nice and snug. It's highly recommended to do this outside and preferably with gloves and a mask as the PCB contains fiberglass and it's not good to breathe in. Next we can get to soldering the components on the PCB. First solder the ESP32 module down, making sure to align the pads with the castellations on the module. I like to first tack down one pad and align the module if need be, and then tack it down on the opposite corner and proceed to solder each connection. Next flip the board over and solder the small components. For this, take your time and use tweezers. 
The pads each have silkscreen markings designating each component. I'll put the designations on the screen now. C1 and 2 are the 0805 16 volt 10 microfarad capacitors. C3 is the 100 nanofarad 0805 capacitor. C4 and 5 are the 1 nanofarad 0603 capacitors. R1 and R2 are the 10 kilo ohm 0603 resistors. And R3 and R4 are the resistors for the LEDs. In my case, they are the 4.7 kilo ohm 0603 resistors from earlier. To solder these components, you'll need a normal, fine tip soldering iron and some solder. Simply tin the pads with some fresh solder and then hold the components over the solder blobs and reflow it like shown, melting the solder and placing the components down into it. This is where using some extra flux would make it a whole lot easier, as flux is what cleans the connections for the solder to stick to. Lastly, for this side of the board, place down your 3.3 volt regulator and solder it in place. Please note that the regulator shown here is smaller than the one you'll be installing, so you won't have to make solder bridges like I am here. Now we're going to solder in the tack switch. To do this, we're going to use the same method as soldering in the capacitors and resistors like shown. Next, it's time to solder in the LEDs. Using your snips, gently bend the LEDs 90 degrees, with the longer leg of the LED on the left hand side, so it lines up with a positive hole on the circuit board. You'll want the LEDs to be sitting just about flush with the PCB, so they line up with the front panel later. Now, simply just solder each leg and trim off the excess with your snips. And lastly, solder in the long 3 pin push button switch. It's pretty self explanatory, the switch goes through the same side as the LEDs and can only fit one way. Moving forward, it's time to program the board. To do this, grab your breadboard jumper wires. These jumper wires have a male end and a female end. For this guide, we just need 4 wires with female ends. Cut the wires and strip a small amount off the ends. To make things easier, you can tin both the wires and the pads on the board. There are 4 pads on the PCB, starting from ground, then TX, RX and power. Solder one wire to each of the pads, taking note of which wire goes to each pad. Next, move over to the USB adapter. Please make sure the adapter is set to 5 volts by moving the jumper across like shown. Now connect all 4 wires to the USB adapter. Ground to ground, VIN to VCC. With RX and TX, these have to be reversed to what is written on the blue retro PCB. So RX to TX and TX to RX. Before we connect the adapter to the computer, we first need to install the correct drivers. I have included the drivers for this adapter used in this guide down in the video's description. Just follow the prompts in the driver installer to complete the installation process. Now with the drivers installed, connect the USB adapter to the computer. For this next step, we need to find out the COM port number of the USB UART adapter. To do this on Windows Vista and newer, simply type in Device Manager into the Start menu search and click the icon for the Device Manager. Once you're in Device Manager, expand the ports branch on the device's tree. The adapter should be listed as a USB serial port with its COM port number in brackets. Keep this number in mind when moving forward to the next step. Next, download the required files from the video description. Inside you'll have a Blue Retro firmware folder and the ESP32 flash tool. Now open the ESP32 flash tool exe and select the following options. Under chip type, select ESP32. Now make sure work mode is set to develop and click OK. With the main program window open, select the Browse button on the first firmware segment option. Find your Blue Retro firmware folder. Inside, find the bootloader.bin file under the bootloader subdirectory and click Open. Next, in the adjacent field, type in the offset. It is 0x1000. Following that, in the next firmware segment field, browse for the partition table.bin and set its offset to 0x8000 as shown. Following that, move down to the next field and open the otadata.bin file and set its offset to 0xd000. And in the last field, open up the blue retro hw1 underscore playstation.bin file and set its offset to 0x10000. Next, click all the checkboxes next to each segment to set them to flash. Moving down, select your USB adapter's COM port and the board rate to what's shown on the screen. And lastly before we flash, ensure that all the other options except for the COM port match what's on the screen. Your COM port number may differ from mine. To flash the ESP32, we first need to make sure it's in programming mode. To do this, do the following. With the board powered by the USB UART adapter, hold down both the boot button followed by a single press of the EN button to reset the ESP32. Maintain the boot button in the press position for 2-3 seconds after the reset and then release it. 
The ESP32 should now be in programming mode and the LED would have likely changed brightness. Now simply click start and wait for the indicator to turn blue in the software. Once flashing is completed, unplug the adapter from the computer and desolder the wires as they are no longer needed. Any future Blue Retro firmware updates can be done via Bluetooth. I'll leave a link to instructions in the description. Next we can assemble the device. I will now show you the two main methods for building the adapter. The first is using the brand new socket from AliExpress, the second will be showing the Type 2 and Type 3 style genuine PS2 plug. Start by stripping 7 short runs of wire and soldering them to the pins of the PS2 controller plug. Please note, two pins on the plug aren't used in this project. From left to right the pins are DSR, init, this pin is not used, SCK, DTR, 3.5 volts, this pin is also not used, ground, positive 8 volts, TXD and RXD. These pins are in the same order as what the pads are on the PCB. With the wires soldered in, fit both the plug, the main PCB and the front panel into the lower half of the appropriate housing. Now simply cut the wires to length and solder to their corresponding pads. You should have something that looks a little bit like this. Now that's all that's left to do is to clip the top of the housing on and insert the four M2 screws and fasten them into their corresponding nuts. Before we get into testing, I'll show you how to assemble the adapter using the genuine PS2 controller plug. To start, determine what plug you have by checking it against the diagram shown on the screen. Going by this, I either have a Type 2 or a Type 3 controller, as the center ground strap is shorter than the Type 1 shown in the picture. You can further determine by opening the plug. To do this, squeeze the plug at both sides and push the connector end away from you. The plug should pop open, if you're having trouble you can also try cutting it open. Just be careful. With the plug apart we can confirm for certain what type we have by referring to the diagram from before. Now simply cut the controller cable to remove the rest of the plug housing. With the plug housing removed, go ahead and remove the insulation from the wiring like shown. This next step is highly recommended. As the ESP32 draws its power from the 8 volt line, we need to beef up the wiring, as it draws more current than a controller normally would. To do this, locate the pin for the 8 volt wire and insert your tweezers into the front end of the connector. We are trying to bend down the small retainer clip that is part of the pin inside the connector. If you are successful, the wire along with the pin should slide out of the housing without any resistance. I'll show a close up of what the retaining pin looks like here. Now simply cut off the old wire and solder in a new one. As before, two pins aren't used by this device, so you can remove the pins shown on screen now. With the socket wiring complete, it's now the same procedure as the other connector type. It is also recommended to solder the cable shield wire to the extra ground point on the Blue Retro PCB. Now close up the adapter like shown before and you're ready to go. As for pairing the controllers, this differs depending on what controller you are using. I highly recommend using the DualShock 4 on the PS2 as it's the perfect match and is super easy to pair. With the Blue Retro connected, and the console turned on, press the boot button until the red LED starts pulsing. Now on the PS4 controller, hold the share and PS buttons until the controller starts blinking. Once pairing is successful, the controller should have a solid LED and the pairing LED on the Blue Retro should turn off. To perform software updates and change settings on the Blue Retro, you can connect to it using Bluetooth on an Android phone or a Windows PC and going to the following address. I'll leave a link to detailed instructions in the video description. And there you have it. This adapter pairs perfectly with the PS2 and has no noticeable lag to my eyes. It's hands down the best way to play the PS2. If you like this tutorial, please consider subscribing and leaving a like. Also let me know down below if you've built one of these adapters and what you think. Until next time, see ya!